I wonder if there are other more people here than any other one. This one looks pretty packed. It's pretty packed. <laughs> uh, good day to you all, and thank you for having us. This is the AI uh, panel for healthcare. If you're wondering what this is all about, so we talk here. Um, Nick D'Onofrio, I'm one of the chairs of the initiative, uh, and I have with me today our controller from the state. He's going to answer every possible question you have uh, from a uh, state perspective or from a financial perspective. So, Sean, thank you for joining us. No pressure. Thank um, you. No pressure. So, let me let me uh, just kind of summarize a little bit and make sure that we're all on the same page. And let's get into what we're supposed to be talking about, which is what your ideas are or problems that we should be solving as we put forward our proposals uh, for consideration by uh, the state legislature with respect to AI. Okay, so that, that's what this is all about. Um, number one, we do understand that healthcare is a really highly regulated industry, so we're not proposers or re-regulated. That's not what this is all about. But this technology is pretty powerful, as we've heard throughout the day, and there are certain aspects of it that you need to know better and understand better and consider better and understand the consequences of. Um, we just heard a wonderful panel about the amazing innovation that exists in this state in healthcare. Um, we had no intention of stifling that. Um, what we would like to come out of this with are ways to actually advantage that to accelerate that, um, to do a better job of creating homes for more of that kind of thinking here in the state of Connecticut. Um, look, I've lived in the state for a very, very long period of time. I came here in 1987 with my family. Um, this, is, this is our home. This is where we'll end our lives. And I can do more of it uh, with you. Um, but we're very real about why we're here and what we're doing. You know, in this state. Um, the, the question that I think several of the panelists brought up is you know, why do we keep educating everybody in this state and why do they leave this state as opposed to stay in the state and actually help us make a difference in this state? That is a legitimate question. So what's missing? And will this pivot with AI either help that or hurt that? Um, and can we use it to our advantage to help us to kind of accelerate and move forward industry in a very thoughtful, meaningful way? I should have also said, I'm old enough to know many transitions in technology. Uh, when I went to school at RPI, uh, the best thing you could take into the test with you besides your pencil uh, was your slide rule. And I don't think half of you know what a slide rule is. Um, but that was it. Calculators were verboten. That was very rarely existed at the time. So we have gone through a lot of revolutions, um, whether we admit that or not. Maybe this one has a different feel to it because of how sophisticated we've gotten and the way we talk to you about things. But those are the things that we want kind of ferret out in this discussion. Um, we want to lead here with some concrete activities where we can say, do this, things get better. Do this, it gets worse. So don't do that, consider doing this. Okay, does that make sense to you? Several of you brought up this issue of data, data sharing uh, in the healthcare session. So I think that's important for us to kind of figure out what do we mean by that? Do we encourage that? Um, data is the critical element in AI. Just to be candid with you, uh, if the data is wrong, I don't care how good your algorithm is, the outcomes are wrong. So how do you how do you make sure that the data is right? To be honest with you, um, and what does that mean? If you're going to share it. What are the consequences of sharing either right or wrong data? Does that make sense to you? Um, some of you, I think, are a wonderful Scott back there, brought up the issue of high performance computing. Like, do you have enough? I mean, could you make better models? Could you do better models? If, if we had 
better computer resources for you. What does that mean? And is that important to you? you know, should we be looking at that as an accelerator to try to improve things? If, if we had better models, if we did better validation in the state of Connecticut with our models, um, would that advantage us? That provide us with more startup capability. Now, I'm not just talking about you know, a, a, a better laptop. You know, I'm not just talking about a better by your desk computer. I'm talking about high performance computing at the scale of the best, highest performing supercomputer in the world. You know, petascale and beyond. So could we, could we, should we think about putting that resource together in the state of Connecticut? And then the last point I'll, I'll raise with you, one of you brought up this issue of regionalization. Should we attempt to do this alone in Connecticut? Or should we attempt to look at who things like we do here in the Northeast? You know, is it, is it wise to reach across to New York? This is really easy for me given my uh, Or you want to reach North or do you want to reach East? Um, there's a lot of states in and around the area that can't afford, you know, these issues, these uh, assets by themselves. Either. Is regionalization something you want to do? So that's kind of what I took out of the session, uh, Sean. Hey, handed with you. No, so if you have other things you would like to be talking about or considering, please tell me. I don't know what I'm talking about. That I was asleep, you know, through most of the presentations, and we'll. We'll pick it up from there. If not, could we kind of talk about those things here? And anything else that you think is inhibiting growth or is concerning because we didn't address it? You know, from uh, but this is going to disenfranchise this part of the population of humanity. We don't want any disenfranchised people to be candidate. We want everybody enabled, uh, but we want to accelerate certain initiatives that allows progress to happen. I'll stop there. Comments, please. Stop. Oh, please. I have a question. Stop. I, I don't know who you are. Oh, uh, State Representative Joe Hodges. So oh, thank you. House did. Thank you, sir. No problem. Thank you. Um, I had a question for the folks in the back, actually, if that's okay. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, so you had mentioned uh, MD Anderson. <laughs> Right yes, there. right here. Oh, right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to get him. Yeah. I'm trying to read him. <laughs> well, I was trying not to kill him. Yeah. Um, well, what specifically is MD Anderson doing with cancer? They have put together an all star team uh, clinicians, data scientists, uh, anal analysts, uh, similar to what Barry is doing, data analysts, and so forth, and all under one roof working on cancer. And the, the thing that they brag about, which I think we should all emulate, is the diversity of their team. It's just not clinicians, it's just not researchers. It's a broad set of skills that are being brought to bear on the problem. So they're all working to create some kind of AI that will help find cures to cancer? Yes. Basically, right? Yes. I'm sure it's more than just AI. I'm sure it's the entire scheme of things. No, but AI is it's a knowing cool it, but it's a core. Yeah, yeah. A AR, it, AI it's is a core, core technology that the team will yeah. be working with to look for new angles to treat cancer. Right. It's on their website. They just M MD Anderson Institute for Data Science in in oncology. And we're right now in in Connecticut. We're in a spot where we're trying to figure out what our relationship with AI is going to be, right? And that's one of the directions yeah. we can go. And I think saying. we have people in the room who are drafting yeah. AI strategies even as we speak. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Why don't we let Sean say a few words to yeah. kind of carry the ball forward and then we'll go back to asking questions. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I don't have the hindsight of Nick. I just walked in the room about five minutes before this panel happened. So I haven't had the luxury of hearing about what's been said today. And I regret that, but my schedule didn't allow me to be here uh, for the day. Um, let me just give you my perspective. I think Nick is right about what he set the tone for this. And I think I'm most interested just to hear from folks here today about what you think that we can be doing. But let me just give you my perspective of why is the comptroller here? Well, in addition to being the chief financial officer of the state and thinking about the things that Nick is talking about, which is 
How do we create jobs here? How do I work with my new friend, Dan O'Keefe, who's the commissioner, about to be the commissioner? Be commissioner designate. Commissioner de de designate. Uh, to, to grow jobs in the economy here in Connecticut, which is something everybody wants to see us do. Uh, but I also, uh, most people don't realize this, as comptroller, run the largest employer-sponsored healthcare plan in the state. 300,000 people get their insurance uh, through our office and through that relationship, we have a interplay in almost every single healthcare space in Connecticut. So I'm just personally very interested in this. And the thing that keeps me up at night uh, as somebody who's involved in government is not about where AI is going. It's that I worry that we don't have the tools and that we are not in a place as a democracy that we can safely have this conversation. Um, and and that's what scares me more than the doom and gloom surrounding AI is just how do we soberly and responsibly look at this, which is a very rapidly changing field uh, at a time it's exploding in the public consciousness. A lot of people in this room have been working on this for a long time, but it wasn't until JatGPT came out that most people in America and the world really understood what AI even was. And now it's changing so fast and rapidly that it's very hard for that not to scare people. And then they come to their elected officials and they say, you've got to do something about this. You've got to stop it. We can't stop it. And I don't know that we should stop it. Um, but the question then for us is, what can we do to manage the public's concerns and to demonstrate that in healthcare, for example, healthcare-related AI can be a fundamental game changer for us, right, in terms of understanding things, in terms of trying to do better research, in terms of lowering costs and improving outcomes. All of these things are realities of what healthcare AI can do, but the public is focused on robots and the Terminator and, and where this may be going. Um, and that's okay because that's, that's their right to do that. Um, but I view it as my job as somebody who's involved in public life here to work with my friends in the legislature, uh, to work with the executive branch to see if in Connecticut we can take the lead on uh, trying to find that fine line between dealing with people's fears and not overreacting when it comes to government that would stifle or chill some really innovative stuff that could be happening in the state uh, that we could frankly be leading on to the next point and be an epicenter of, of this growth. Um, James is not in the room, but I wanna give James an immense shout out because I think, um, I listened to the Hard Fork podcast. I don't know if any of you else listen to that New York Times podcast, this is a great podcast. And they were talking the other day about how it was hard for them to come up with names of elected officials who are leading on this, right? I mean, the president put out the blueprint, the EU just did what the EU did, but there are not a lot of people who are being very thoughtful about this. And I think James is certainly one of the people, and we're lucky to have him here in Connecticut. Uh, somebody who texts him that I said nice things about him, please no, not here to say that. Uh, but to Nick's point, uh, really just want to sort of put that out there, that that's what's on the top of mind for me. Um, and if we can find through this conversation today, some ways that we can be helpful to you and meet that mission that I'm trying to think about of how to meet that fine balance, uh, I think we'll be doing good for the state and doing good for the people that we both serve, whether you're in the healthcare uh, innovation space or you're a regulator or a policymaker. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Sean, thank you for that. And I'm going to also put a plug in for the Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering. You should all know what that is. It's your asset in the state of Connecticut. Happen to be a member. That's how I'm here, because um, the good senator was smart enough, along with his colleagues, to write Case into the bill that started this task force and said, somebody from Case has to co-chair this with us. And sadly, Case picked me. So that's <laughs> like, um, but they, are, I mean, many of the smartest people that we have in Connecticut are in Case. And when you talk about trying to rally you know, the, the most meaningful crowd that we could rally, we could rally them, to be honest with you. Kind of get behind our thinking that we can do that. I mean, that that's a force the likes of which any other state would would give their first, second, third warning for. Okay? So keep that in mind. So um, healthcare systems are going through some challenges. And and healthcare system strength is in their data, if they are large enough and they keep the good data. Yeah. And uh, more data, more good quality data is gold. Um, the question comes is that Come on. Uh, 
one healthcare system has the data, why would they want to share it with somebody else? Because it's also proprietary. They can find ways to be able to create their own products, which would help enhance this. And, and what are the models that are out there which have allowed sharing with profit sharing? Sure. So, I mean, this is a really important question. Uh, we had Ferrucci speak earlier deliberately by giving you an idea of how this whole thing works. Nothing works without good data. You have to understand that. AI doesn't work. It's garbage in, garbage out. So if the data is wrong, the outcomes are wrong. That, that's why the cat isn't a cat. You know, the cat is something else. Um, now, having said that, the third thing you want to do, first thing we would want to do is to curate that data. You would want to make sure that whatever data you're going to use is indeed really good data. There's only so much you can do. So one of the things you might suggest is why don't we get the coalition of healthcare providers together to curate the data together? You know, uh, one one agency, New Vance, has one view of data. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Yale has another view of data. Uh, Hartford has a different view of data. Uh, just to name three of the healthcare systems in the state, um, maybe together. Maybe anonymized, <laughs> so that you know I'm not I'm not stepping on you. You're not stepping on me. Uh, we say there it is. You know the three of us have triangulated on that data pool, and it's it's rock solid. But I guess if I can just I don't want to put words in your mouth, Senator. But I think what he's asking about is what would incentivize each of those three actors to make major investments in their own data infrastructure. And then share that or open that up to their competitors in this space. Is that what you're more getting right. at? And if the health systems mm -hmm. were financially super robust, they could be kind and shared. But everybody's struggling on the financial end of the healthcare system. So that's yeah. why it's it, this is a revenue source too. Or if it's awesome. So, so I, say, well, I, let, let's do one other thing. Uh, I'm going to try to remember. Thank you. So let's go up here uh, online. So um, you have your hand up there. Uh, yes, I do. You're on mute. Uh, oh, I've got you on mute. I don't know which one it is. I'm not on mute. Uh, For those that don't know, that's Representative Pat Dillon. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, fantastic day. And um, hang on, Pat. We can't hear you. D is it me? Can I do it? No. No. Yeah. My machine is. Sorry, Representative. We're going to find a way to get your voice. Are the speakers in the in the meantime, can yes. I say something? There is a technique called multi-party computations that allows people uh, allows different parties to keep their data and share some of it, but without knowing exactly know which party what the other party has. An article. So, so, so the, I like that. That's a good idea. Yeah. And you say, why would they do it? because they get to a, a clean pool of data faster. And then they can all share it and go off and do their own thing, do their own piece of the data. So that could be done. That, that's, very, that's a very realistic oh, okay. um, you know, approach. I don't know what's wrong with the system. You know, either data sure. cleansing, data, data, data review, or uh, enterprise process, um, which I, I like. Who am I talking to? Uh, it's something we don't do enough of. Great, thank you. The Russians and the Americans do it for satellite data. So um, they share the computer. Uh, technology. It's computer yeah. So you have to be yeah. careful. Yeah. Yeah. They might be know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, we just really were forced to give it up. Yeah. Like, all research has been done with synthetic data. So one, one of the goals may well be a working group working on creating synthetic data. So that, that's a but those are incredibly important words. Synthetic yeah. data, you know what that means? It doesn't exist. It was created through a model. And you need to know if that, if you need to know that it was synthetic data, you need to know it was created somewhere as opposed to I observed your behavior and that's the data that I use. You can create synthetic biases. I hear you. So, so, yeah, so I think this is where I think some people have problems like we're alluding to. Uh, <laughs> You know, we're talking, you mentioned earlier, you know, about there's a lot of smart people in this room. There is, for sure. Um, that there's a lot of people here that are 
But there's also a lot of smart people outside. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get there. You hear a lot on the news, so, so people in really high positions in the private sector, right, that deal with sure. this topic all the time, and they're they're expressing concerns. I don't know specifically what they're concerned about, but I think something like that would be a little concerning because who is going to be the authority to, to determine the validity of synthetic data? Because you just said that it's data that's not really there. It's, you know, we're creating a, a, a model that will then spew this synthetic data. I understand the usefulness of it, right? Because it's it, it's like a, you know, proverbial guinea pig. Yeah. We're, we're having- we Or the mouse. Or a mouse, right? For Jackson. Line. Exactly. So we have this, you know, synthetic data here so we could do stuff with it to try to come up with some, you know, useful conclusions. But who then becomes the authority to, to understand whether that synthetic data is, is valid or not? So it, it, it's do number one, you can yeah. find it. So it's not it's not a fool's errand. It's not like it's done. Uh, you could tell yeah. the way to determine that it's synthetic data. So it's nothing wrong with it. Okay. If you use yeah. it correctly, but you want to know what it is. You want to know the validity of the data source that you're using at all times. Okay. And synthetic data is knowable. It's not easy to find all the time, but it's always knowable. And that's maybe one of the things that maybe we want to push hard on, to be honest with you, in the state of Connecticut, is the validity of the, um, data the source. I, I just wanted to, I had a very tiny comment, actually. Uh, Please. And, I, and I do want to thank uh, everybody for, uh, Jim really put together a, a great team, and I'm going to read David presentation from this morning, I felt like I was back in school until so, uh, I have to go through some of the cognitive issues. But on a very concrete level for the report that's going to come out with uh, actions that the legislators would be involved in, uh, the CEO of IBM mentioned that he believed that the community colleges and the state colleges would be the ideal places for training in AI. And we didn't follow up on that. And, and we had a, a, a tremendous amount of material to unpack, but I don't wanna lose that because it plugs into the equity issue and the inclusion issue about um, not, there, there's always going to be a garbage in garbage out problem, but, but the AI issue has the potential to create to widen the, the 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 gap between the haves and the have-nots, so that I thought that his comment was very interesting, and and we don't have time to get to it today, or we didn't, but I, I didn't didn't want that comment to get lost. No, we're we're not going to lose that. You're spot on. Uh, he meant what he said. I know him well, um, and we'll we'll dig deeper on that, and we'll understand better what those programs are that he has in mind. Um, and, you know, I happen to agree with him that all of that, you know, can, can, and more. So one of the biggest issues, if you're looking for something from the controller perspective, we do not do very good workflow analysis of the jobs that we have. We should do a better workflow analysis here in Connecticut because not everybody has to have the highest degree yep. to do the job. But oftentimes when you're pushed, You'll just take the best applet you can find. You'll, you'll take. No, I only want PhDs. Yeah. Like really? I mean, maybe maybe somebody who just has two years of a higher education will work. That work, coupled with what Arvin was talking about, could go a very long way. Yeah, we are we are doing that work in Connecticut. Um, my friend Josh Duvall was the previous commissioner of DAS, state agency that basically is in charge of a lot of the hiring, and then I do all the administration of those employees. Uh, his successor and myself have been leading an initiative is to, to review all of the state jobs and to see whether or not any of the college degree requirements that are out there are arbitrary. Um, and the goal of that is to then try to lead everybody in Connecticut to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, because somebody who has a 40 year resume of career experience who doesn't apply for a job simply because in 1964 they didn't get an MBA at a college uh, to me is just silly. Uh, and I think as we think about our workforce challenges, I wonder how much of that can be solved by just looking at these arbitrary requirements, not to dissuade people from going into higher education, but if we have 100,000 jobs to fill in Connecticut, 
how many of them could be filled by people if we just retrain them a little bit, or if we took away some classifications that I mean, no, I mean, so you. So can I just, I, I know we have other hands that are up, but I think just to refocus Nick's original comments to you all, just to use our time wisely, which is what, what are the tools that you all need to succeed? What are the things that elected officials or this report could do that would concern you or inhibit your ability to grow? And, and how can we sort of have a conversation in that frame? So yes, and then yeah. Keith. So um, Kevin Carter, internal medicine owner of a uh, uh, technology company called Compass Innovations that does, you know, part of the product that we uh, bring to market and that AI um, embedded in them. And one of the challenges that we have as you introduce new use cases, um, so we have a lot of things that are, you know, traditionally Amazon-based solutions that we're teaching Alexa, you know, insurance, healthcare, you know, medical school concepts, right? And so, but as you introduce new use cases, there's some hesitancy of First one. And so um, I've seen other states, you know, enter into agreements where or fund programs where you have, you know, Connecticut, you know, the makeup of the Connecticut based healthcare providers are first with the Connecticut based technology company and additional grants or funding to help spur that innovation um, with some commitment that the, the growth of those companies then turn into jobs for these residents. And, uh, so that would be something that I think would be really interesting because you start thinking, okay, well, well, what is the incentive, right? So if I'm going to a healthcare provider organization to do that versus to, I can provide the technology for free, but there's some need, some effort that they have on their side mm -hmm. that they have to teach people to do it and do a new training session or there's a new workflow that they have to implement to consume that technology product. So it's not free for them to pay title. And so um, I don't know if that's not. It's, a, it's really a very good thought. Yeah, and it's, and it's been, I mean, like Massachusetts has done that, it's, uh, you know, pretty successfully, uh, you know, with the, the growth in technology. So maybe an enablement platform can stay there. Yeah. And if it's part, that it kind of starts to absorb some of those costs. It yeah. makes those transitions a little bit more realistic and planned. And, and then, you're, then it's the technology company working with the provider. Sure. And you're, you're brokering that relationship. Uh, and other relationships that I've seen like DC government is, is very purposeful about whenever they're procuring on behalf of DC to work differentially with DC based companies as well. So like you know as you're procuring in the state of Connecticut, you know, if there's ways that you could preferentially you know procure from you know uh, Connecticut based companies with and, and they often put the restrictions on that you know 51% of the jobs that they create that that contract has to be in that state to do the same thing. Right. And so it's um, so kind of getting back to that concept here with the It's a great thought. Jody, you had your hand up? I did before, so I'll, I'll share it too. Because I know the question came up about embedded data, so I'll start with that. But you know, the FDA decides on a case-by-case -case basis if they'll accept embedded data for people. And so currently they're the arbitrator. And you know, right now we're not doing away with clinical trials. Sometimes they'll accept what's called synthetic control arm. Um, so it just increases the number of overall patients and the time limits to be more efficient. But they ultimately decide if the company can still get the stat data or if it's not. So I, I don't know if I would focus there. I think on your question though about um, what what could be provided in Connecticut for the catalyst the HB sixty four. I think you know I'll go back to my comment around the clusters for who are the some of our neighbors, whether it's you know, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, um, they form what's called life science clusters and have been provided anywhere from 65 times to $100 million just to really you know, build out the nature of life sciences that are focused in the state and just to ensure critical mass. And I think you know, with resources and having more companies, you're creating more talent because sometimes for us, perception becomes reality and people might be afraid to relocate for one position to another. I think how much more is actually here. So I think just making sure that you know we continue to stand out and invest. The only question there is whose regulations will you use? You know, if you build these geographic clusters. So who will lead? Who who will superimpose whatever the governance structure is, you know, on AI, that's the tool around which you decide to cluster. 
mean, that, that that's something you just need to think about. Just very, very quickly, quickly. just very quickly, I think the state is rich in healthcare access and ability, and I like training more people and with degrees at community colleges, expanding scope of practice for people who already are working here, I think will help. As far as AI, we have Jackson Laboratories. I think she talked about the FDA. She said, no matter how much we do in drug research development and programming and, and moving it faster, the FDA is a roadblock because they don't know how to deal with AI. And so having that, because I always worked for a company that actually was shut down by Johnson & Johnson, because the process took too long to take us off for a thing. So how do we develop a regional relationship with the FDA and build on that to say, hey, if you come here, we're going to work with the FDA directly to make sure, like, for example, the first, if you saw the timeline for that little stroke thing, it's like another two years out. Well, we've got to shut that, we've got to shut that time down somehow. So how can we convince the FDA that we are the center of the nucleus that can move these products forward safely because we've got the process? So the, um, this gets back to, uh, and Josh spent some of his life trying to educate the FDA to get them to move things forward by using modeling and simulation. We didn't succeed in doing that. They still don't trust those models. So if you, if you want to move them forward, we're going to have to have a better way to convince them that our models are better, they're accurate, they're real, and believe them. It's either that or wait three years right. you know, to prove that the data is all true. That's the way I think you start to make some progress here, to be honest with you. So it does kind of come back to Scott's point about this whole idea around modeling and simulation. Do we have enough meaningful computational capability and work going on that says we have looked at this 97 ways beyond anything you could have ever imagined here's here's the data now what don't you like about this and tell me where the fringe issues might lay scott yeah that, that also cuts to explainability which, which is not a trivial matter in all of this so if you can model as long as you want but unless you can explain it to appropriate course but what happens though, and, and is there a role where the state government, for example, could play an intermediary between the cluster and the FDA, for example? Because these cluster employees could spend their whole life trying to infiltrate the FDA and convince them they're right. But would an outside validator help with that? So we were suggesting that the collaborative could provide validation and verification services across the community because it's an economies of scale and it's a kind of very special science to be able to do it. Yeah, so I'm not an expert here, Scott, but I mean, maybe this geographic cluster you were talking about would help if we could get enough, to your point, momentum behind it that says, you know, there's seven of us that think this is a really good idea. Now tell me again what your problem is. So, I mean, and you keep getting the problems put back at you to resolve. So. I would never give up on this. I know it's frustrating for everyone, especially in healthcare. Um, but you know, we model and simulate things that we don't even like to talk about. We model and simulate the nuclear stockpile. We don't blow up bombs anymore, but yet we know exactly what each bomb will do. And more than just our bombs, we actually know what the enemy's bombs will do because we model them too. So you have to kind of encourage yourself to, to, to go out of your comfort zone a little bit. There eventually is a space where you have to jump over. There's a legal case required somewhere here. I don't know if we can, to your point, you know, close that by putting the state resources behind it and saying, we're jumping over that. Yeah, come with us. Sean and the commissioner wants to so thank you, Sean Jeffries, uh, you Festival of Pharmacy. So in addition to some of the comments that were made earlier about building all these great things, I'm thinking back to a slide presentation that I saw from Dan last week about all the great things that are already happening in Connecticut. So we need to keep the talent here. So you know, that slide presentation should be shared with everybody in the room because there's a lot of great things that we, that we can use to attract people here and keep our talent. There's no sense in building all this if everybody's going to go somewhere else. You got any ideas? Well, that's what I'm going to challenge the state to help us uh, solve. So it's sent to the my job. Yeah. <laughs> that's your job. Is that yeah. your job? Uh, so, so maybe just, uh, I was going to comment just on the concept of who might regulate. Um, 
And I'll, I'll first acknowledge some biases. So I, I joined the administration as chief innovation officer in July, and then took the full executive executive for nomination as commissioner of economic development. So my biases are economic ones. Uh, and that doesn't mean I ignore that there are potential repercussions or, or regulatory burden, burden that exists. Um, but I, I just want to acknowledge my biases and sort of share the next few comments. You know, when I think about economic development, and this is part of the deck that I, I gave in that presentation, you know, I, I think we are entering or have already entered an environment where comparative advantage and competitive differentiation is now focused on assets that are free flowing. People can increasingly live where they want to live, independent of a commute, you know, as the building constructs. Companies can locate their headquarters wherever they want to locate, and we're increasingly in a hybrid environment. So, so states will increasingly compete on creating an environment, an ecosystem that is a magnet that attracts those people. And things like tax incentives will always be part of the puzzle. Don't get me wrong. I always have to say that because corporations do it when they get to start focusing on corporations. Stop. We love you all, and we want you all. But the reason why I bring this up is that I think about what happened during the era, era of globalization. Um, and what we saw was we saw manufacturing go where labor was cheap, right? And that, by the way, deeply impacted the rest of our cities. Uh, so we have a billion of our cities. And you know, now if you think about what could potentially happen with AI, it's exactly the knowledge work is not as cheap. And we're a services based company, that's 70% of our economy. So think about that as now an existential threat. If, if things can move that free flowing, we become the leader, not in the opportunity of AI, but in the regulation of AI. My fear is that drive that economic, economic activity elsewhere. We have the highest per capita uh, penetration rate of actuaries. But what if you can do that in a different state? You, know, you, you don't need to be an actuary with the chat GPT said, and actually you're more politics. So that, that's where I just think we need to, uh, again, I, I see this because I don't want to sound like I'm saying I want to increase an equity, but it's cl hopefully clearly not what I'm saying. I'm just simply saying one other way to enable equity is to increase our economy. And I, I, what I would love to see us do is focus on enabling this as an environment where these technologies can thrive and just being a little bit careful of trying to be the front edge of the sphere on right. If we're going to have there's going to be federal regulation. By the way, I, my view is, and I said this with Mark and others, there should be no Section 230 in AI. It shouldn't absolve anyone of the rules and norms and regulations we already have in place. I'm just trying to suggest we don't, we don't add to them, right? This is a space that is moving so, so I was an investor for 25 years. I have never seen a technology movement that adopted corporate my entire career. And Nick, I, I don't have the longitudinal observation set that Nick does, but I, I suspect you'd, you'd agree. I mean, this outpaces everything I've ever seen. And so our ability to regulate it is, is definitionally impossible, right? We will always be playing catch. So it's almost definitional that all we'll do is slow it down and potentially set the economy. So, so like, I that. mean, to complement Jim's comments, uh, we didn't even talk about the most important part of it, which is eventually all this stuff gets met in chips. It's not a software issue. It's not a plot on top issue. What are you going to do when it comes in your computer and it automatically turns itself on? And to think that Intel isn't doing this, or NVIDIA isn't doing this, or AMD isn't doing this, is naive. It's where they're going. Why do you think these companies do so well right now? I mean, they make another announcement, and all of a sudden the reports algorithms pop up, and everybody says, oh my God, this company must be worth two twice what it was. So maybe we need to include our in that in our thinking here in Connecticut to say we want to see what you're doing too. We want to know when that stuff gets here. But Dan's right, you can't hold this back. I mean, when this stuff finally gets embedded in hardware, pretty much game over. Uh, pretty much game over. And if you don't like that hardware, somebody else in the world will make it for you. And and you'll have to be dealing with them and their hardware. So I don't want you thinking uh, in, in one scene. I want you to think as systems people, you know, kind of end-to-end -end systems thinkers about this. You can't just push this in one place and expect it doesn't show, doesn't pop out and show up in another place. It does. But we are a capable state of dealing with it as a systems level problem and understanding the issues associated with it. That's what I encourage you. Please. 
I'm the five minute morning guy. Just letting you know uh, five minutes. Oh. <laughs> Uh, to Dan's point, I, I, I think the government has a convening power, and we also have the power of messaging that this is a priority for us. And if we were to say this is a priority for us, then we welcome any company who's going to be interested in it to join us in this conversation. If good people come in a room together, good things start to happen. And some of them we may not necessarily have to be able to control. It's business individuals, startups, we are going to look at what they have perhaps there's an opportunity to get people together and then look at what are the, the company skills or direction that they have and then have them interact with each other and make money and, and uh, hire more people. So I think that's something that can be easily done. And then perhaps in the future we'll see where the rest of the country is going or the federal government is, and then we can start to see how we can improve this. But instead of regulations, we should figure out a way to make it easier for them to come. That's that's the kind of, and I don't know what the word for that is. Well, the closer you get them to you, the easier it is for you to regulate. Them, to be honest with you, it's a good strategy if you get them closer to you, yeah. so that you know better what they're doing, right, and where they're going, because they're always going to be one step ahead of you. Uh, excuse me, one thing I think that uh, I'm probably almost said at Yale, and I mean this should be about a singular thing, which is you know Connecticut has some of the most educated, most capable people in the entire country. By the way, our health is better than most anyone else in the country. It's a great place to live. We ought to be intent on saying this new industry, which is, you know, it, it, it is going to transform everything. We want it here. We want as much as possible here. And there's got to be a grand strategy about that. And I'll tell you the things that are constraints are talent, data, and compute, and capital. And by the way, I'll say on the capital side, we've got all like a lot of investors here, but they're basically saying go to Boston, go to, go to San Francisco. Like we're still not able to galvanize them. we've got connected innovations but if we're really serious i mean then we have to say that what does it take and it does take hubs like what yale ventures is doing and i, I you know, i'm from yale so i'm just saying <laughs> you'll uconn as well but i'm just saying though, what they did in cambridge was cambridge uk yeah was quite uh, remarkable i mean they basically created a, a hub for being in and, and the companies came and the talent went there and they were able to do that we should be able to say what does it take to create Cambridge UK in Connecticut? Create two of them, I don't care. But it, it's got, it's saying like that this race will be won in the next 24 months. I mean, places are gonna get embedded. And then if they wanna go to, to, to Kendall Square, they'll all be in Kendall Square. I mean, there's no real estate there left and it's too expensive. But I'm just saying we have the capacity to say, this is what we wanna be. And part of it is you start talking like that and it can become true. You say Connecticut is the next generation. This is our industry, knowledge workers in Connecticut. We can become the ideal place for these knowledge workers. It's a great place to live. It can be made affordable. And we've got the academic institutions that can be the backbone and anchor state. And by the way, without those, you don't have no differentiating issue. But we've got that. And I think it ought to be an aspiration. We'll just start saying that out loud. We are the best place in America for the next generation of companies around data science and AI. Because, you know, and by the way, let's make, the, let's let's create the pipes. I'm, where's the internet in this state? You know, I can go places I don't even get phone connection. I mean, it's sort of like part of it is like what infrastructure are we build in here that we've got the best place. And I'll talk to them, the GPUs. If you want to build the companies, then the state makes investment and says, we've got the GPUs here, new companies. If you're going to make a commitment to stay in Connecticut, you get access. I don't think the data is a winner because when you basically say we're sequestering data, we've got great data in Connecticut. You only get it if you're in Connecticut. That's not that's not helping raise all ships, and that's not in the right spirit. But if you say the investments we're making around talent, including the community uh, uh, colleges, and around compute, and the work that we're doing in partnership with the two ac main academic places, by the way, all academic places should be able to participate. But I'm just talking about the backbone anchor, and we should be e egalitarian about that. All of the institutions in Connecticut should be able to participate. We have to put, make that a requirement. But we're saying those two anchor places can be the ones that begin to draw. They're the gravity that begin to draw. And they also, when they have talent, you get access to compute. You, you, we're starting to build a talent pipeline. We've got all these other reasons why people should come here. We're working on the capital side. We're saying, you investors, help us make it so Connecticut is the place people go to your home. We've got a lot of investors already in the state. And, and then I just say, we start saying it out loud. So that like it can become true. And we, by the way, we start believing it. Because you know the other thing? We have an inferiority complex in the state. Really, we don't, we do. We're not Boston, we're not New York. Like bullshit. 
Like we should say like <laughs> and, 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 and pound our chest and be proud that we can be the best place in the nation for this and show the way. And you know the thing is, you don't need trains, you don't need anything. You just need the access to the, the connectivity of what the future is. So the guy in the back's freaking out. So we're gonna have to go in a second. But <laughs> but but my but my question is, I, I guess, is to pick up where Harlow left off and where Dan left off, which is that yes, we need a strategy to shout from the rooftops from the governor on down. We are here. Should come here. But then when and if we get the attention of people, given that every other governor and every other person is saying the same thing, it's when somebody says, all right, you know what, I'll give Connecticut a look. That next level down, though, what is the thing that we have to do to create the environment that everyone else just simply have confidence in Dan. You're the right guy to be able to do this. And it's about the strategic partnerships in the state and basically having that vision. Here's what we are. Yeah. Here's what we're going to do. Yeah. And I really think it is point person. And then connectivity to all the people in the state that can make it happen. No. And just like simply, Sean, I don't think it's simple formula, but it's about saying, let's get behind it and make it successful. Well, I mean, one of the things we should not do, to Dan's point, to your point, we should not overregulate this. Uh, we, sh we should absolutely understand this, articulate it, and be able to help everyone understand the risks associated. Yeah, we'll be first as a nation in constraining it. That, render that risk, my, my render the risk explicit and help people understand what you're going to do to manage. My, my view is regulate when you learn there's something that needs to be regulated, not before we think that might be. Yeah. That, that, that's what I, I want to see us do. Because otherwise, again, we're playing from behind it, we're never going to play. It's always, it's always, Dan, it's always risk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A, a slight contrarian view on the regulation, and Dan and I have discussed this. You, Delaware is a strategic place of regulation. That's why 90% of the companies that incorporate sure. in the United States incorporate in Delaware. Delaware. We could be a strategic regulator of AI that our regulatory framework invited to be. <laughs> And protects them. Oh, yes. Exactly. Exactly. I do do it. Do it. However, I, I'm with you, so I'm not against it. But the tendency now is to do the opposite. The tendency is to be heavy-handed. The tendency is because the pedestrian view is this stuff's going to eat me alive, yeah. and I don't want it to eat me alive. So we have a lot of education to do it as well. It's not going to eat you alive. There is no singularity theory. So don't worry, you'll be around for the next 50 to 60 years. As you Connecticut know. itself is not going to be able to protect everyone anyway. It's got to be a, a joint issue around federal. federal. I mean, I, I don't think we're going to do anything that's contrary, to be honest, with to the federal regime. But the question yeah. is, how much tougher are we going to be here? Yeah. And that will be kind of yeah. But let me just one more thing. I, I'm in agreement with everything that's been said. But to go back to Joe's point, there will be pressure. Of on policymakers to regulate them because of their fears of what they don't know enough about. And that's the history of our world. That's the world that we live in. The challenge will be, as a recovering legislator, I can say this, <laughs> is arming these people that will maybe be asked to be a heavy handed regulators than they are today with the good that can come out of doing what we were talking about. And that is something, to Dan's point, that we need each and every person in this room to help with, because that constriction will only hurt you, but your ability to help us tell the story of why this is good for Connecticut will only help you. But we can't do it alone. To Dan's point. Yes? All these suggestions for regulation that are coming up because the minute you start to regulate, things are going to change. Yeah, and it's going to muck up and it's going to be uncomfortable with it. But if you have an ongoing resource of some sort, or good idea, um, yeah, it's going to at least be helpful. And then you can use that network to help with that. Yeah. Uh, Logical evolution of this task force. Yeah, who knows? <clears throat> yeah, please. So, uh, I'm Barry Stein. I'm a physician evangelist at uh, One Innovation. One of the things that at least drives me is the mass potential to transform what we do every day. So, we look at AI, we could look at AI as like a new drug or a new device coming into the market. See, if we think about how we can make our state competitive, it's incumbent upon us to think about what, what is it to the patient's state? What 
are they concerned about with all this stuff? How is it going to impact? If we create a very efficient, provocative way of determining if what we're going to be putting into healthcare is safe, better than any other place in the in, in America, in the world, I think we can accelerate innovation. If we don't address the perception of risk, well, that'll be the consequence. Ultimately, yeah. that'll catch us. And I don't think any other states around this country are at risk of how they're going to mitigate it. It doesn't require regulation, it requires a body that can accelerate that in a state. And that is the ability to do I don't believe we have the structure right now to do it. And I think some of us in the room will probably be delivered to develop that in a way that can accelerate growth. It's the risk. I'm with you. Let me give you the Just, I want to give Nick the last word. I know we got to go. But, um, Nick, what are the ways that people in this room and beyond can meaningfully engage with you as you do your work to then give the legislation the report? Go ahead, Philip. Um, so, if we have to write uh, now, between now and January to get it done, um, I'll talk to uh, James and maybe we try to get. Uh, an early copy of what we're doing done so that we can send it out for public review and understanding. Because I haven't, I think you, what you said, Barry, was absolutely spot on. If we twist this around and look at it from the end user perspective back as opposed to from where we are in, and then assess all the risks associated with that, we have to do for nothing. That, that's how the winner will be determined because it's not going to be built off of technology. The technology is going to be democratized. It's going to be there for everyone to either screw up uh, or benefit. And if we build that environment here in Connecticut, then I think we get what you're looking for, which is uh, talent, data, compute, capital, and we're the knowledge workers for America. Come here if you really want to make a difference. First, you make a difference later, but if you want to make a difference first, come to Connecticut now. So that's what I will take back with me. And I will encourage James to get as much stuff out to all of us as we can before we have to put our final uh, pen to paper. Does that make sense? Yes, that thanks everybody. Other comments? Yes. So, George, now we don't have a lot of time, George. I have a lot of all of this. I just want to piggyback on, on what Dan has said and so on. To answer your question from George, on how we can get more people here, more businesses here. Number one, the state has to get out of this debt diet initiative that we're doing for the last two years. We've got to start investing in businesses and do concerns. Number two, we got to get more development done working with the academia in the state of New York. Number three, we got to get deployment of the AI in the state of New York across all of the industries. With that, we may be lucky because AI is porous. There is no way to regulate it. There won't be for another 10 years, perhaps. We can only try catching up. So my suggestion is to bring back to the governor to revise DECD's investment policy and try and work out a model with the academia COVID-19. Thank you, guys. Back to the other side of the Thank you all online as well. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>